Hey guys, welcome back to Ben and Bernie's channel. For those of you who don't know who we are, my name is Brian. We do product reviews, tutorials, and have a live chat feature on our website to help you through your Brutia 911s. Before we get started, I do want to give a big shout out to Vexet. It's another YouTube channel that we are starting to collaborate with. All the footage that you see shot today was done by them. Please check out their channel in the link below. Today's video, we're talking about oxygenation of your wart. We're, we're scientifically taking the methods and we're actually testing them to see how many parts per million of dissolved oxygen are actually in your wart. Let's check it out. All right guys, so as we mentioned, we're doing some testing today on oxygen levels and the impact each method has on getting the dissolved oxygen into your wart. Uh, we did a video a number of months ago uh, about the five common methods that most people use. The splashing, uh, rocking, stirring around with a whisk, using an aquarium pump, and then just injecting pure O2. The video was actually very well received, but we did get a comment that led to some questions that I had by uh, Finbar was the user that left the comment. And basically was asking, you know, how are we able to achieve beyond the theoretical maximum of dissolved parts per million of oxygen in these liquids, especially when they're not just water, they are uh, wart. They have dissolved sugars in them, which impacts the amount of O2 that can be dissolved in the liquid. It was a fantastic question. And I thought, well, you know, really those machines are way too expensive to test, to get, to figure out. Uh, but then I came up with an idea of a aquarium oxygenation test. This was 10 bucks on Amazon. This was fantastic. So what we're going to do today is take each method of adding oxygen to your wart. We're going to have them parsed out into little mason jars and we're going to test each method over varying lengths of time and see how much oxygen actually dissolves in there. Now there's a couple of things to keep in mind with this that make it a little less than scientific. First and foremost is that we're just using water. I'm not using wort. Um, so there will be some impact in the real world, but I figure it'll give us a good enough ballpark to understand what's actually happening with the dissolved oxygen. We're also using a small size. We're not doing a five gallon batch. These are little tiny mason jars. So the oxygen pickup technically should be faster and have it reach its theoretical maximum faster. So that actually might work out to our benefit. The plan is to take it and do the test on the method for 30 seconds, repeat it on two minutes, and then leave the containers open for 30 minutes and see, does this saturation of oxygen actually end up leaving and the levels drop? So a lot of great questions we're gonna to answer today. Let's get to it. Okay, so let's talk about the testing method. Testing honestly was not that difficult. It was a lot of little steps, which after several hours and so many samples being tested over and over again, I would kind of start to lose my focus and, and track of where I was. So I managed to power through it because I really was curious what these results were, but it did get a little tricky after a while. Step one was to take the water and just boil it to make sure that all the oxygen that is normally present in water is boiled out. Similar to what happens when you're boiling your wort and you're chilling it down at the end of the boil, there's really no oxygen at all left to dissolve. And I wanted to replicate that. The samples, as they were still hot, I gently put them into the mason jars, sealed them up and let them cool basically overnight. So they're not exposed to the oxygen in the air and they shouldn't have picked up really anything as far as more dissolved oxygen. Once that was done and I was ready to do the testing, I made sure that when I was putting the little sample jars into the mason jars to fill them, that one, I was putting it well below the surface so it wasn't splashing and adding to that oxygen pickup. And two, I made sure the jars were completely full with no head space. There was quite a bit of rocking and shaking that had to happen to mix up the chemicals and I wanted to make sure that again, I wasn't kind of swaying the results one way or the other because of head space in the jar. So the first step, basically, you dunk the little testing jar in the sample, you add a couple different drops of these regions, uh, and then you really shake it up and then let it sit for a couple minutes. And the color sample would change to kind of a brownish yellow, and then you get this really weird precipitate that would come out. It was real chunky looking, it was odd. Once that was done, then you put a couple more drops of another chemical in there and rock it back, back and forth some more until the sample cleared. Now, the color didn't change, it stayed that weird brownish yellow, but it became crystal clear. Once that was done, then we were finally ready to actually test for the dissolved oxygen. For that, there was a final chemical that you add one drop at a time, and you count the number of drops that you're putting in it. So I always kind of did it in five drop chunks. So I'd do five drops, shake it up a little bit, and if the color was still that yellowish brown, add five more drops. Once 
the sample color disappeared and it became clear and looked just like regular water again, you would stop, figure out how many drops of this final chemical you put in there and reference that on a chart because the more drops you put into this sample to get it to change colors back to clear, the more parts per million of dissolved oxygen were in the sample. Uh, and it was interesting to see that the color, as dark as it was, actually also related to how much dissolved oxygen there was. All the samples were fairly similar in the color darkness of that brownish yellow, except for the pure O2 sample. That one was extremely dark, which obviously correlated to how much more dissolved oxygen was in that sample. All right, guys, so after several hours of testing and a very dry beer glass, um, we've got some interesting results from our uh, testing that we did. So first and foremost, let's go through some of the results that we got. Oh, thank you. Much needed. So some of the results were not super surprising, but there were some learnings for sure. So let's talk about... First method, splashing. I took the mason jar, dumped it back and forth a number of times, twice actually, measured it, came up with five parts per million of dissolved oxygen. Repeated the same thing, but this time did it twice as long. Poured it back and forth four times and measured it, came up to about 7.5 parts per million. So definitely an increase. And I think within the range of, if you're splashing it, as you're filling, you'll get to eight parts per million, which is right in line with what we had talked about in a prior video. The next method was rocking your carboy back and forth. Uh, and I did this with the jar, just tilting it back and forth. I did it for um, 30 seconds and then for two minutes. So for the 30 second back and forth, 2.5 parts per million. So not a whole lot. When I increased that time to two minutes, it actually hit about 10 parts per million. I was surprised at that because I would think that the splashing as it's cascading down would gather more oxygen than just rocking it back and forth in the jar actually hit a higher parts per million, above the eight that I thought it was gonna be, so that was interesting. Whisking, 30 seconds, got us to five parts per million. Two minutes, 7.5, so we'll call that an eight. And again, that's right about where we think it should be using just the environmental air that's around you. The aquarium pump, this was an interesting one. 30 seconds of just regular atmospheric air that's been filtered through a centered stone, five parts per million after 30 seconds. After two minutes, 7.5. So again, we'll call that 8 uh, for the sake of keeping everything equal. Now, the biggest surprise, and this I thought was very cool, injecting pure oxygen, pure O2 into the water. 30 seconds at 1 liter per minute, that's an important number when you're dealing with oxygen, uh, hit 15 parts per million plus. Um, the kit that I got can't test beyond 15 parts per million, so it capped it at that. And that was after 30 seconds. There was no point in going beyond that because there was no way I could measure beyond that. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. After all that was said and done, I let everything sit out with the lid off for about 30 minutes and went back and retested to see does the oxygen eventually stabilize or does it kind of evaporate out. Interestingly, all of the methods, uh, including the super saturated pure O2 sample, all maintained their original oxygen levels. Uh, and all testing was done at 60 degrees. So it was actually very, very interesting to see how each method has an impact. And as I've said before in prior videos, anything you're doing with atmospheric air will get you to eight parts per million or 10 in some instances, but that's really the max that you can hit. Pure O2 far exceeds that with that particular technique. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our video. We really, really appreciate it. Please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. It really means a lot to us and lets us know to continue to con to bring you this wonderful content. Uh, another big shout out again to Vexet, who was instrumental in shooting all the footage that we got today. Again, their link is below to their channel. Please check them out and show them some love. Catch you later, my friends.